This is KGW News at 11. We're following up tonight on Portland's large role in the first presidential debate. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Laurel Porter. The protests and riots were a big talking point for President Trump last night. And of course, the president's been talking about the unrest in Portland now for months. Most presidential years, Oregon is kept out of a national spotlight. This year, Portland's reputation is being used as Republican campaign firepower. This billboard in Montana, for example, says, don't want Portland in Montana? Vote Republican. We asked Oregon political strategist Dan Levy about how this is impacting Portland's brand. Portland's been hurt by this. There, there is no doubt. Um, the casual observer uh, across the country, um, they've not seen or heard much positive about Portland, regardless of where you stand on the political uh, spectrum. Um, unrest, uh, violence, uncertainty, uh, that's not a good brand and it doesn't it doesn't wear well. And get this, the last reference we could find for Portland in a presidential debate was 40 years ago. That's when an executive at the Oregonian newspaper was able to ask a question during a Reagan Carter debate. Excuse me, Portland, the sheriff just came out today and he said, I support President Trump. No, none of the sheriffs in the counties in the Portland metro area have endorsed President Trump, as he said last night in the debate. Multnomah County Sheriff Mike Reese quickly denied that last night, and he spoke to us further today. Every time he talks about Portland, it makes my job as sheriff a lot harder. We're trying to do everything we can to keep our community safe, to build community support for the work that we're doing and to address the racial and ethnic disparities that exist in our criminal justice system. The sheriffs of both Washington and Clackamas County said they have not endorsed President Trump and have not made any national endorsements. We did find out a law enforcement labor group, the National Fraternal Order of Police, did endorse Donald Trump. The president of Oregon's chapter, State Police Detective Roger Edwards, ran for Clackamas County Sheriff this year, and that is as close as we could find for who the president might have been referencing. Another key moment during the debate came up when President Trump was asked to denounce white supremacy and then said this regarding the hate group, the Proud Boys. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, what, you, you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right-wing. Who would you like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and right proud proud boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. The president today tried to clarify his position, telling White House reporters he doesn't know who the Proud Boys are and they should, quote, stand down and let law enforcement do their work. Still, the Proud Boys got a big boost in notoriety on the national and international stage. Tim Gordon looked into who they are and their connection to Portland. You don't have to go back very far to feel the Proud Boys' presence in Portland. Their rally in Delta Park last weekend built as an event that would draw thousands, only drew a few hundred. But in August, Proud Boys and others from the alt-right mixed it up with Antifa and other protesters in violent confrontations here. Sociologist Randy Blazak has studied the alt-right and hate groups for years. He says the Proud Boys formed online in 2016, like other similar groups, with an anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-feminist agenda. With the ascent of uh, Donald Trump really kind of moved into the streets. And one of the best ways to kind of characterize them is that they're sort of the modern equivalent of the racist skinheads of the 1980s and 1990s. Blazak says it's unclear how many Proud Boys there are. Its members are spread throughout the country, but some live in this area and others like to visit. Uh, because Portland has a pretty strong anti-racism community uh, and a progressive community, that's 
brought the, the kind of attention of the people on the right, that this is where you want to go to have your fights. The violence has been chilling. Proud Boy Alan Swinney was just arrested for what police say he did in August, including shooting and injuring someone with a paintball gun, spraying someone with mace, and pointing a handgun at a counter protester during an intense confrontation. They're not a traditional white supremacist group. They are a nationalist group uh, that trades on white supremacist themes. Well, who would you like me to condemn? White Proud supremacists boys. and right Proud, Proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. But However you classify them, the Proud Boys have a lot more exposure thanks to the President of the United States and is capitalizing on it. Leader Joe Biggs put out the Proud Boys logo with the stand back, stand by slogan added. That Trump never denounced white supremacy Tuesday night has Republican Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler of Southwest Washington tweeting, Last night's debate was the worst I've ever seen. Since it wasn't made clear last night, let me state unequivocally that all of us must reject white supremacy in all its forms and violence by anyone for any reason. The president needs to clarify his remarks immediately. The Southern Poverty Law Center designates the Proud Boys as a hate group. Blazak says it is one of several emboldened to damage our democracy. It's a very threatening uh, uh, moment because th these people are also very armed, as we've seen. And um, there's certainly reason for concern. I mean, this is a fascist movement. Tim Gordon, KGW News. A protest happening in Portland right now marks two years since police shot and killed Patrick Kimmons. The protesters say Kimmons' death is an example of racism among police and within the justice system. They continue to call for defunding or abolishing the police. Patrick Kimmons' mother was among several speakers tonight. It's been so many murders before George Floyd was choked. That just put the icing on the cake. I have an angry mother that is looking and demanding justice. A grand jury found the Portland officers who shot Kimmons were justified. Surveillance video shows Kimmons shoot and injure two people in a downtown Portland parking lot. Officers said he put the gun away, but then pulled it back out and pointed it at them as he ran away. Officers shot him nine times. Now to the coronavirus pandemic. Oregon reported 220 new cases today and four more deaths. That brings the case total to more than 33,000 statewide. This graph shows the daily number, which was picked up recently. Officials warn it will be another week or two before we fully understand how coronavirus is trending in the state, and that's due to disruptions caused by the wildfires. There are only four counties still in phase one of Oregon's reopening plan. Yesterday, Lincoln County became the latest to move into phase two. That means businesses like the Bijou Theater in Lincoln City can show movies once again. For months, the theater has been selling popcorn and showing movies at their makeshift drive-in. It's really weird. It's like you're waking up from a very long dream and you kind of think, you had your act together when we've done the theater for 24, 25 years, but now we're relearning things again. Workplace outbreaks contributed to a large majority of the cases in Lincoln County, which had held the county back until now. Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas, and Malheur counties are still in phase one. There's some relief tonight for those suffering in the coronavirus pandemic. Oregon's residential eviction ban was scheduled to expire today, but then Governor Brown extended it through the end of the year, meaning rent won't be due for another three months. Catherine Cook takes a look at how that's impacting both renters and landlords. For many Oregonians, the pandemic made paying rent impossible. Unemployment, decreased wages, child care. Governor Brown recognized that. In April, she issued a six-month eviction ban protecting those who couldn't make rent. This week, she extended that ban through December 31st. A relief to some, but not all Oregonians. It's very unsettling to have the goalposts keep moving. Philip Owen is a landlord and the vice president of Rental Housing Alliance Oregon. Since April, he says his tenants have fallen behind on close to $30,000 in rent. The chances of them catching up 
is going to be slim to none. Over 50 years, Owen has grown his business to 75 housing units. He says with equity, he'll be fine. He's worried about other landlords. Out of the 2,100 in the Rental Housing Alliance, 80% own four units or less. Owen believes that many renters are hurting, while others are working the system. They're saying, I don't have to pay your rent. You can't do anything about it. They're not trying. I think there are going to be some tenants that, because they don't have the money, are just going to disappear. Troy Pickard hopes they will be the exception. As managing attorney at Portland Defender, he says the extended eviction ban is a godsend for many renters he's working with. And they were really worried about what would happen when it came time to pay October's rent because as of a few days ago, they probably felt like they had absolutely no protection. Under the governor's new order, rent missed from April through September will be due by the end of next March. Rent missed in October, November and December will be due in January. Pickard says the time to plan for that is now. And maybe part of that plan is going to your landlord and trying to make an arrangement to make payments at a discounted rate so that you don't have this crushing obligation that comes due all at the same time and your landlord is going to get something. We welcome you to the Portland City Council. As elected city. officials consider what to do next, Pickard hopes they'll look at the big picture. It's not going to do tenants any good if a bunch of landlords wind up being foreclosed on because they can't pay the mortgages on their homes. Philip Owen believes it's too late. I'm seeing a lot of landlords sell out and leave Portland because we don't, we don't see it getting any better. The city of Portland and Multnomah County have extended their own eviction moratoriums. Also this month, the city council voted to require landlords pay for relocation costs if they increase rent by any amount between now and the end of March. Catherine Cook, KGW News.